So my name is Marwa and I work um, as a volunteer slash activist with a Palestinian digital rights group uh, called Hamla, which means campaign in Arabic. And uh, we have been uh, documenting and researching into human rights or digital rights violations that are taking place in Palestine um, and Israel. And one of the most recent um, case studies or work that we're looking into is the use of predictive policing uh, by Israel, which is rather a sensitive issue given that there isn't a lot that we know about this subject. Um, I promise I won't go into politics, maybe just a little bit, uh, to explain the context in which uh, this predictive policing system has developed um, and how it's used and what are the human rights and digital rights uh, implications of it. Um, so it starts in October 2015. Uh, there was a surge uh, in violence in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories where there was um, a new trend of a rise of lone wolf attacks where young Palestinians and mostly teenagers would go and commit uh, violent attacks against Israeli citizens or Israeli security uh, officers and that instigated a, another cycle of violence. These young people did not were not affiliated with any political group. They were not part of an armed cell. There was no sort of political leadership behind them or organization. They just took matters in their own hands and spontaneously decided that they want to uh, do something. Um, and as a result, uh, for this, let's say, new trend of violence, Israel uh, or the government of Israel blamed social media companies uh, for the incitement um, to violence online. And so they have blamed companies, and, and, and namely Facebook, for hosting and facilitating uh, terrorism and incitement to violence. And so in September 2016, some Israeli officials said that there is a special agreement between Facebook and the government to monitor and try to tackle um, uh, online incitement something which uh, Facebook actually denied uh, in a forum that we've organized at Hamle in Ramallah in the West Bank. They said that there is no um, special agreements and that the Facebook standards apply to everybody. Um, and they deal with all kind of requests from governments the same way. So they have to be, um, they have to take down content if there's enough evidence that they're actually insightful. However, experience speaks differently uh, because right after a delegation from Facebook visited um, Israel and met with Israeli officials, um, a number of um, accounts belonging to uh, Palestinian journalists and uh, two media outlets with millions of followers were immediately suspended. So Palestinians uh, and activists got online and started a campaign under the hashtag of Facebook censors Palestine. Um, and after that, Facebook apologized and said that was just a mistake. And so the, the accounts were restored. So aside from trying to pressure social media companies, um, the Israeli military intelligence started uh, sweeping and mining social media accounts to try to look for um, early warning signs. And so since October 2015, which is the start of the violence, uh, there we have documented around 800 cases of young Palestinians arrested simply because they posted something on Facebook. Um, and they have been put under administrative detention, which means that you are detained without any legal process. So you're not, you don't have a trial, there's no charge. And in most cases, these people are detained for four to six months. And when that uh, period is over, it then it gets renewed again. Um, in some of the lawyers that follow up on these cases, they said um, when there was a charge, the charge was uh, uh, incitement to violence through social media. Um, the, some cases, the evidence was not presented um, because it was a state secret or it was an, an intelligence secret and therefore they cannot uh, disclose that uh, evidence. Or uh, some of the detainees said that they were shown uh, uh, screenshots of their Facebook posts and uh, they were interrogated and charged with incitement based on that. I mean, some of the stories, there are so many examples. I mean, there are 800 uh, cases, right? Uh, but some of the stories and examples is the story of Tamara, which is a 14-year-old Palestinian girl from East Jerusalem who uh, was arrested in the middle of the night from her home because she, po she wrote on Facebook something like, please forgive me. Um, and that could be directed at, I don't know, her boyfriend or her family or some teenage drama stuff. 
Uh, but according to the, the Israeli min, uh, m military intelligence, it, it, it kind of got, um, grabbed their attention because they interpreted uh, that she is about to go and uh, carry out an attack. Another uh, prominent uh, case is the case of the Palestinian poet uh, Darin Tatur. Um, she was, she's still actually under house arrest. Same story. She, um, her home was ransacked by the, the security forces, and she was detained from uh, her house in the middle of the night because, um, as a poet, she she posted a video in which she expresses her anger at the murder of Palestinian children. Um, and that was enough to get her arrested and again accused of uh, incitement. But obviously it's a clear case of a violation of freedom of expression um, online. Now she's banned from using the internet, she's under house arrest and she's forced to wear um, an electronic, um, I don't know what you call these, uh, bracelets. Um, so there are, as I said, there are many examples, but the reason why I, I m mentioned these two cases is to, to highlight the fact that um, these arrests are not related to actual terrorism or violent attacks or even the planning to do terrorist attacks, but they are related to censorship and, and the violation of freedom of expression and also privacy of, of Palestinians. And this is especially so if we are looking at what's happening on the other side, right? So at Hamle, we did um, a study or research to see what our Israelis are saying. Is this incitement to violence online only a phenomenon on, this, on the side of Palestinians? So what we found is that in 2016, Israelis posted racist or provocative posts against Arabs and Palestinians on social media every 46 seconds. And almost 60,000 Israeli internet users wrote at least one post containing either racism or hatred towards Arabs, and most of these uh, were related or had like some explicit or implicit call for death and killings of Arabs. And none of these internet users were uh, charged or arrested or investigated for um, incitement, which again shows that this charge of incitement is rather a very broad um, a definition and it could include any kind of resistance to Israeli policies. Now, what we learned this year um, through uh, investigations done by Israeli media is that behind these 800 arrests or this mass arrest campaign, um, there's a predictive policing uh, system in place, which um, analyzes or does social media analysis and flags certain people to be arrested uh, later um, based on an attack that may or may not commit in the future. <coughs> um, in other words, these 800, or let's say the majority of these cases were arrested uh, based on a machine hunch. And now, how does the system exactly work? We don't know the exact inner workings of it. Uh, it's the work of military intelligence after all, but what we know is that, um, so when it comes to predictive policing, there are two kinds of um, tools. One that looks at, the one that is location-based, so it looks, um, at the algorithm basically uh, flags where, is it where and when the next crime could happen, so the security or the police officers would deploy people to try to prevent that crime from happening. Or it could be people's based where um, there are certain profiles developed. Ten minutes, okay. So you develop certain profiles of likely attackers, and again, the algorithm if you know monitors people's activities online, and if there is something that's suspicious, it flags that person as a likely attacker and that system is what Israel uh, uses so, so, so they have built uh, a number of profiles uh, of likely Palestinian attackers based on certain data points uh, some of it related to age location um, and the psychological uh, buildup of, of these people and um, according to media reports there were psychologists sitting on interrogations to basically drag information and see how do these young people think and and um, what could be uh, seen as um, some uh, 
warning signs. But also they look for certain trigger words, um, which are often used in the Palestinian discourse. Things like uh, the word uh, shaheed, which means a martyr, and this is a term that we use for anybody who dies uh, from the conflict. Um, words like al-Quds, which means Jerusalem, al-Aqsa, uh, which is the holy um, uh, Muslim site. Um, any Quranic verses from the, the, holy, bo uh, from the holy book. Uh, poetry, uh, if you put picture of a person who just uh, was killed or arrested uh, by the Israeli forces. And they particularly look at um, the activity of friends and families of people who just got arrested to assess whether these people would um, retaliate. Uh, so, for example, a 23-year-old uh, Palestinian kid with a Down syndrome uh, got was shot dead and then two months later they arrested his brother. And during interrogation, uh, the interrogators showed him a screenshot of his face Facebook um, and that he changed, uh, uh, he, he posted a picture of his dead brother. And that was enough for them to, f to arrest him and, and to ask him straightforward, are you planning a retaliation attack against Israel because you changed uh, or had the picture of your brother up uh, online? Um, so what does this all mean, this predictive policing? Um, business for Palestinians, it means that if you're a Palestinian living in Palestine, it means that you are a suspect by default and you could be arrested for whatever thing you posted online. Um, and that this is for a, for a crime, imaginary crime that you may or may not commit in the future. Um, and this is one of the things that um, some ex-veterans of um, the elitist unit of the Israeli army is called Unit 8. Uh, 200. It's a it's an elitist signals uh, intelligence unit that is part of the IDF and is often compared to the NSA in terms of its uh, uh, surveillance capabilities. Um, so some veterans or ex-veterans at the time they wrote a protest letter to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to protest against um, the unethical and unlimited surveillance that is being committed against Palestinians. And he says, um, I and I quote. There is no distinction between Palestinians who are and are not involved in violence. Information that is collected and stored harms innocent people. So again, this is to stress that predictive policing reinforces this governmentality that everyone is a, is a suspect and everyone um, sh therefore should be surveilled and monitored. Um, but for us here sitting in, in, in the room, uh, we have to look at this predictive policing in Israel from a different perspective. or a wider perspective, because this unique combination of uh, having this uh, algorithm uh, s uh, policing system and also the ability to detain people and put them ad under administrative detention, which I assume in Western democracies that could not be the case. You can't just simply, at least in theory, detain someone uh, and not press charges and not go through the, the proper legal process. So that combination is somehow unique to Israel and maybe um, cannot be replicated elsewhere, but that of course does not mean that such technologies are not being employed uh, and growing in other police and security departments around the world. Um, in fact, the EU um, counter-terrorism coordinator, which I can never pronounce his name, um, said in Israel in meetings with the Israeli government and in some conference that he uh, that the EU is, is interested in adopting this predictive policing uh, system used in Israel uh, specifically to try and stop lone wolf attacks uh, in the EU. And in other um, uh, EU states like Denmark, they have bought um, the Danish police, they have bought that uh, similar predictive policing system from one of the companies that allegedly is involved okay, uh, in, the, um, in the development of the system that we now know in, in Israel. And only recently, like two months ago, um, the UK, uh, there was some reports in the Independent that uh, there is a delegation going from the UK government to, to Israel um, to exactly cooperate on predictive uh, policing systems after the uh, recent attack on London Bridge. So again, they want to look at how to stop lone wolf attacks by monitoring uh, social media and doing uh, social media um, analysis. Um, so, and, and of course that is not a surprise given that um, uh, Israel is a leader in exporting cyber arms, cyber security, surveillance technologies around the world. 
Um, and I think uh, the reason behind this prominence is, is, is the revolving door between its army and the technology sectors. So some of the leading Israeli comp companies that uh, export surveillance technologies or cyber arms, cyber security uh, products, um, they were founded by ex-veterans of that unit, the Unit 8200. Uh, and uh, there is no legal barrier for these people who, while working in, these, uh, in this unit, to take ideas uh, developed there related to military intelligence and then later uh, sell them um, as private sector companies. Which means that, um, and that's in the words of an Israeli scholar, the Palestinian territories become like a certain lab to test certain technologies and fine tune them and then sell them later to countries around the world. Um, so, and then of course the Israeli government and other governments justify the use of, of predictive policing um, uh, by saying that it, it drops crime rates or it's effective in stopping uh, terrorism. But I think that um, these claims, just exactly like the systems that they support, they lack uh, statistical evidence. So a lot of the research um, that was done on the effectiveness of predictive policing show uh, no backing whatsoever that they are indeed effective. So one of the studies, or actually two, done by the RAND Corporation in the US, they tried to look at um, the use of predictive policing systems in certain US communities, and they found that they neither reduce crime nor they increase public safety. And there was another research done by, um, it's called the Human Rights Data Analysis Group to look at uh, how predictive policing recycles existing biases, something that Maya just discussed. Um, they, they looked at, uh, they used algorithm and tested in, in Oakland, US on drug crimes data, uh, and they found out that the algorithm was telling them to go exclusively to areas where there are only black residents and low income residents. So I guess, and I'm ending here now, um, the, the argument whether predictive policing is, is effective or not is not um, what we need to think about. Um, I think predictive policing changes the uh, the traditional logic behind law enforcement, which means that if you committed a crime or you're planning to commit a crime and there's hard enough substantial evidence to arrest you, then you're prosecuted. But I think we really need to stop and, and uh, think very hard about systems that changes this logic and you might get arrested and prosecuted based on a crime that you may or may not commit in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>